Assalamu alaikum khawateen hazrat. Wasim Hassan welcomes you to lecture number 24 of Marketing for Non-Profits, MKT 628 at the Virtual University of Pakistan. The component of learning is going to be about advertising evaluation. With meaning, we need to carry out evaluation of the advertising campaign that we put together. Now, this is despite the fact that advertising managers, or for that matter, marketing managers in any non-profit are very careful about putting together their communication campaigns being very sensitive to all the fundamentals of communications. In other words, they are very careful with uh, the fundamental that uh, they have to have different communication uh, campaigns for uh, different audiences. They are also careful about the fact that um, their audiences could happen to be at different stages of the behavior change model, and therefore they need to carry out different campaigns for audiences at different stages. They're mindful of the fact that uh, somebody has graduated from stage one to two and from two to three. And therefore, along with that graduation, they also have to uh, bring about changes in their communication campaigns in order to make them very effective and meaningful. Despite uh, all these uh, factors, uh, advertising campaigns still need to be um, evaluated. And uh, those are evaluated on three different counts. Okay, the one is um, the uh, copy test, the second one is the media test, and the third one is the expenditure level test. The expenditure level test is all about budgeting okay, because marketing managers have got to be careful about the fact that they do not overshoot their budgets. So three different components are tested in uh, you know, two different ways. Uh, marketing people have at their disposal uh, the two different sets of tests which are classified as uh, pre-tests and post-tests. In other words, there are tests that are carried out before an advertising campaign is kicked off and there are tests that are uh, put into place uh, once advertising campaign has been launched. So in other words, um, in the pre-tests we test the copy and in the post-tests we basically test the media to what extent the media has been effective. And um, of course, in relation to the, both these levels of tests, the meaning pre-tests and post-tests, we can easily the, get the evidence of uh, the level of expenditure with which uh, is uh, planned to be incurred or with which already has been incurred. We plan to incur expenditure in relation to uh, pre-tests and uh, we talk about the uh, expenditure that already has been incurred once the campaign is launched and it is over. Let us talk about the pre-tests. Like I said, they are all about uh, the copy testing and there are uh, a few um, the mechanisms whereby we can assess the strength of uh, the copy or otherwise of it. And the first one is known as the uh, comprehension test. And as the terminology goes, the basic objective is to reveal the strength of comprehension. In other words, whether or not our audience uh, is in a position to understand the message very clearly, because if comprehension is weak, then the message is no good and the communication is uh, no good at all. Communication, as a matter of fact, is all about comprehension and we want to connect with our audiences and we want to engage them and therefore, communication has got to be not just clear, but very, very meaningful. So in order to uh, ensure that uh, the comprehension on part of the audiences uh, is absolutely uh, the full scale, marketing people can have their own uh, the ways and means to uh, determine what kind of uh, the words 
are to be omitted. Now, for example, uh, technical uh, jargons and uh, all those uh, words uh, which are uh, difficult to understand uh, for an average person are to be avoided and they do omit that. This is a test uh, where they uh, look into all those formulas and uh, the basic benchmarks that they have in order to see that uh, a campaign is really meaningful, is not beyond the comprehension of general audience. They also look into things like the length of the sentences. The length of sentences in any communication, may that be for advertising or may that be office communication, has got to be limited. And these are kind of a couple of standards and benchmarks that marketing people have to themselves in order to look into the possible effectiveness of their campaign in terms of its comprehension. The main feature here is that uh, this kind of a test is carried out within the organization and the, the marketing manager along with his associates uh, they carry out uh, uh, this test and uh, nobody from outside is uh, involved into looking uh, how uh, comprehensible is the copy of uh, the communication. The next uh, test is what they call uh, formal uh, questionnaires. This is an extremely interesting test and uh, it happens to be a little more credible. Well, as a matter of fact, it is very credible because uh, you get into contact with uh, your uh, respondents who are uh, part of the uh, audience or uh, who could be people from the advertising world uh, the good at uh, the giving you their uh, critique uh, about the copy of your uh, communications. And therefore, uh, what you do is uh, you put together a uh, set of alternatives and uh, uh, send those to those respondents, asking them about uh, their feedback in terms of uh, which set of alternatives is uh, more effective. In other words, uh, which is the set which they think they will be influenced by most. This is kind of a direct rating method uh, which uh, works for organizations and uh, as long as they are uh, confident about uh, choosing the right respondents, uh, the uh, response they get uh, could be uh, quite very uh, accurate. The other option that we have uh, as part of this uh, the particular task, the meaning formal questionnaires is uh, the sending a set of alternatives to uh, the same respondents or similar kind of uh, respondents with a uh, few uh, the more questions. And as a matter of fact, you ask them questions on uh, the five different dimensions. And uh, these dimensions are then uh, tested on a scale of uh, the 1 to 20, for example. And uh, you uh, give um, uh, the weight on that particular scale to uh, each and every dimension uh, that I just uh, talked about. Uh, you like to uh, test things like um, the attention strength of the, the copy of your communication, the meaning to what extent the communication uh, will draw attention of uh, the readers. And this is something which uh, the respondents could have to get back to you with. And on the basis of their feedback, you will give uh, the uh, level of effectiveness uh, of uh, uh, drawing attention of your audience uh, toward the communication on a scale of 1 to 20. It could be like 10, could be 15, could be 18. Uh, whatever is the response is going to determine the uh, level of the scale. The second uh, dimension that uh, you uh, talk about is the read-through strength. Uh, this basically is the strength of the communication in relation to uh, engaging uh, the, your audiences. If the audiences uh, say, or the respondents say, that uh, the communication has the uh, potential to evoke your interest to the, go on reading the communication, then uh, the communication passes the test. Okay, it is a good piece of communication. It really engages uh, the, your respondents. The third one is the cognitive strength, uh, which means how understandable is the message uh, given in the copy. If the, the message is very clearly understood, we can say that uh, the level of cognition is good and uh, it passes the test. The next dimension that we like to the test our copy on is uh, what we call cognitive strength. 
Cognition basically is uh, the understanding and therefore uh, this test uh, essentially tells us to what extent the message is understandable. The objective of course is to uh, make the message as clear as possible so that it could be understood uh, by any of uh, the members of the audience. The final and the fifth uh, the test is uh, known as behavioral strength and uh, this uh, basically tells us to what extent the message uh, takes the, the audience uh, into the follow-through action stage. In other words, it uh, must be uh, powerful enough to actuate uh, the members of the audience to take the final action, meaning uh, the members of the audience who happen to be at the final stage of uh, the preparation and taking the action, the communication should be, should be so effective that they end up taking that particular action. So as you have seen, we test this particular alternative on five different dimensions and all the dimensions are variable, have the highest score of 20 and the scale is from 1 to 20, making the aggregate 100. And on a scale of 1 to 100, we can have different scores for the five different dimensions of this particular test. And this also goes without saying that um, this uh, is uh, more credible and authentic uh, in relation to getting the direct rating uh, from a set of respondents on uh, the one piece of uh, the alternatives. Now, this is not to undermine that particular option uh, of uh, testing your copy. It all depends on the circumstances and uh, the nature of advertising that you are involving yourself in. If uh, the ads are going to happen to be such that uh, you are uh, the well off with uh, the uh, option one, which is just sending uh, a couple of alternatives to your respondents and seeking uh, their direct rating on the effectiveness of the copy, then so be it. And if you think that advertising is uh, a bit more complex and uh, you need to be uh, very clear to yourselves about the effectiveness of the copy of the advertising, you may as well carry out option number two. And the objective here is not to overdo your testing and at the same time not to fall short on the assessment scale because you would like to be quite very clear in objective terms as to how much effective is the copy of your advertising is. The next test is known as uh, the portfolio recall test and the mechanics of this test the works like the following. You put together a portfolio of different ads and uh, they send those to your panel of experts uh, who go through with all those ads and after they have seen the ads uh, you ask them to give you their uh, uh, feedback on uh, whatever they registered. Now. At the time they give you their feedback, the ads are not in front of them and this is where the real test lies. They have to tell you what they really remember about the effectiveness of those ads and they are asked to say anything they want to say about the different aspects of the ads they saw. And this is how you come up with your assessment of which ad or which message carries a higher level of effectiveness in terms of reaching the audiences. The fourth and the final test marketing people have to themselves in terms of the testing the copy as the part of pre-tests is the focus group tests. And uh, as uh, we already understand, uh, the focus groups uh, are uh, a platform where uh, you have uh, the more than one person. And as a matter of fact, you have uh, somewhere like you know, six to 12 uh, the persons uh, who uh, work collectively to give their feedback to you on your uh, advertisements. And uh, therefore, uh, the a synergism which is created by the collectiveness of the members of the focus group is the more vibrant and it creates the more reactions in terms of the one-on-one -on -one session with your respondents. And the assessment that's given as part of a group has a higher level of authenticity in relation to 
an opinion which is given by a single individual. So this is uh, how different uh, tests are put together to um, establish the effectiveness of uh, communications uh, before uh, those are put together and kicked off. Like I said earlier, okay, we have uh, another component okay, which uh, is tested um, as part of uh, post-tests and that is the component of media. Of course, you cannot test the effectiveness of the media until the time okay, you uh, really have lost okay, your campaign and therefore okay, you carry out these tests okay, after uh, the launching of okay, your campaign. And the fact is okay, you get to know the real strengths and okay, the weaknesses of your campaign. The, the very first test is known as okay, the recall tests. And uh, you measure the recall okay, by talking with uh, those people okay, who use okay, the media regularly. And okay, you talk uh, with those people in relation to your campaign okay, without uh, pinpointing any one particular medium. Okay, you ask those uh, uh, respondents to give you okay, their uh, impressions in terms of anything that they found interesting and exciting about the, the advertising, uh, regardless of uh, the medium, like I said earlier. It could be about television, could be about uh, the magazines and newspapers, or any other medium uh, within the overall tools that uh, you have used to uh, kick off your advertising campaign. The basic objective here is to uh, register to what extent the, the advertising uh, was noted and to what extent it was remembered. And the fact of the matter is that the kind of questions that you ask them without uh, having to resort to any one particular medium um, says it all in terms of for the generality of this particular test uh, in relation to its notability and its remembrance. The next test that uh, you can carry out is what you may call recognition tests. This is uh, an extension of the recall test and uh, the fact is you could build up on the, the recall factor. But the only difference is that uh, you talk with your respondents in relation to just one particular tool of communications. For example, just a magazine or television or just the internet. And uh, you talk with the respondents in terms of extracting uh, their responses at three different stages uh, of uh, their uh, impressions. You ask them things about, you know, to what extent they have noted the, the advertisement and uh, then um, assess what is the, the percentage of respondents who really noted the ad. Don't forget, you are talking about just the one tool, for example, magazines. You like to get into things like uh, how many people have seen the ad and associated themselves with that ad. So in other words, how many people have there been who saw the ad, read it, and can recall the name of the organization or the program and associate themselves with that particular program. And uh, hence giving us the clear assessment of uh, the reachability of uh, our message and the effectiveness of our message in terms of uh, the developing certain associations. And then you also like to assess how many people really read uh, the most part of the communication. You know, not everybody goes through the whole uh, the advertisement. There are people who just note it and they say, yes, we have seen it. Uh, you know, there are people who know what the advertising is all about and they can talk about the organization, your program. Uh, but they do not really know what you have talked about as part of the uh, copy of the advertising. And then there are people who have read the most parts of the advertising and uh, can tell you the uh, things that you have talked about in detail in relation to your program. I mean, uh, they can say that your program is all about anti-smoking, but they do not know uh, the measures that you are suggesting, uh, you know, you want those people to, to come to the um, office and to be part of uh, uh, a group, you know, on which you carry out uh, the certain uh, programs in terms of lectures or, or whatever, uh, with the help of audiovisual aids, uh, telling them how injurious smoking could be. So there are people, you know, who just see the ad and associate themselves with that ad, and there are people who go through the most parts of the ad and take the know and understand the ad in its entirety. So, you know, this really can give you leads into how 
uh, effective has been uh, your ad in terms of generating the level of interest, uh, meaning what percentage of people noted the ad, what percentage of people associated themselves uh, with the ad, and uh, what percentage of, percentage of people uh, read uh, the most parts of the ad. The third testing method is uh, what you call direct response uh, the method, and uh, this is a test in which uh, you like to seek uh, the final outcome of the, you know, the program and then determine to what extent your advertising has been successful. And you talk directly with your respondents. For example, with the help of certain coupons which you send as part of the advertising campaign, you send those coupons to be sent back to you with information which you require from your respondents. Here, you know, a big question is, why should they send those coupons back to you? They have to have some kind of incentive, you know, to send those back to you. And therefore, you come up with, um, you know, things like the free checkups. If you happen to be into a healthcare program, you can offer things like you will get a free uh, checkup uh, in the form of uh, the free uh, blood pressure uh, check, uh, blood sugar uh, test, and so on and so forth. And uh, then you see that you can assign a 0800 number on which they should call you and tell you what to think about your uh, the advertisements. And then again, the question is, why should they volunteer that kind of calling until uh, they are really convinced about the nobleness of uh, the cause? And uh, I would say, if uh, your communication has been effective in terms of engaging them, then they really will call. Uh, but then, just in order to make sure that uh, they do take this step of calling you and sharing information, or rather their feedback with you, you again have to um, incentivize them. And you can incentivize them by telling them, uh, if the call, you can provide them with the more information, which is going to be even more helpful than what they have seen as part of the advertising program. Uh, so these are um, some um, of the uh, testing methods that uh, we have at our disposal uh, to the test uh, our advertisements. Uh, and evaluate uh, the communications uh, the while they are uh, the being prepared, uh, the meaning before uh, they are launched. And uh, we have certain tests uh, which we carry out after uh, campaigns uh, have been launched. And uh, the pre-testing basically is done to uh, test the copy of your communications. And uh, post-testing basically is uh, carried out to uh, test the effectiveness uh, of the media. And uh, you determine things like uh, to what extent um, the uh, media or tools that you have used could have been noted and people have uh, associated themselves with the cause and to, to what extent uh, the people really have gone through a complete um, uh, advertising that was intended for them and so on and so forth. With this, we are finished with advertising evaluation and on to the next component. This component is going to be about uh, managing the media in terms of uh, public relations. I've talked about uh, the paid advertising and uh, the personal persuasions in terms of uh, the putting together of our communication campaigns. But the fact is that uh, there is still the one more tool which is extremely effective in terms of uh, uh, highlighting the cause uh, that we people uh, that have uh, that very dear to us and uh, the cause that we are uh, the publicizing. We are publicizing by paying money to the media and we are publicizing the, with the help of uh, the personal communicators and by developing uh, relationships with the different audiences. Here, I'm going to talk about uh, the one audience which happens to be the media and the importance and the power of uh, that media uh, dictate that uh, we develop uh, an extremely good relationship with them to be able to earn advertising uh, on the media. Now, this is a new terminology. What is earned advertising? This is what the whole thing is all about, as a matter of fact. Earned advertising as against the paid advertising is that form of advertising which you, as the marketing managers, extract from the media by not paying. 
you know, you convince the media to the extent that they really are bought into the cause that you are working for. And they offer you airtime or they offer you some space in the print media and so on and so forth. And this is how you earn some space and time and publicize your cause. Given the strength of the media, the marketing managers all across the globe are getting more and more sensitive to this particular fact of developing good relationships with the media. Now, the question is, what are the different forms of these earned ads? We have to be clear about that first. Well, you must have noticed founders or community leaders talking on television as part of a certain program meaning getting uh, some airtime out of uh, a lengthy the program and talking about uh, their cause uh, for a few seconds. And uh, that is something uh, which can go a long way in terms of uh, generating promotional mileage. And that uh, could be a promotional mileage uh, which is uh, far greater than the one that you generate with the help of paid advertising. The second uh, form of uh, the earned uh, the advertising is uh, uh, the opinion pieces and articles that appear in magazines and newspapers about different uh, the social welfare causes. And, uh, you know, it again uh, is uh, with the help of uh, the media that uh, we are in a position to uh, create that space uh, for ourselves uh, by convincing them that uh, this is a cause uh, for which um, media has to come up with their support. And of course, uh, there are uh, the certain dynamics uh, which uh, are at play uh, before uh, the media uh, becomes uh, uh, favorable uh, to your cause. And uh, I'm going to talk about that uh, as well as a separate component. But uh, here, uh, let's confine ourselves uh, to the fact that uh, the relationship building with um, the media is of uh, imminent importance nowadays in order to be able to earn some advertising space and time on the media. The question here is, uh, who are the people who can earn you this kind of advertising? The answer lies in having very special people who direct their efforts toward getting time and space on the media. And they are the people who are known as public relations people. Public relations always has been around, as a matter of fact, you know, for as long as organizations have been around, because they are the people who have been responsible for uh, developing images of uh, their respective organizations. Not only they have been responsible for developing images, they also have been uh, responsible for uh, controlling the damage whenever their organizations, you know, were engulfed into the different kinds of crises, and they still do it. The development that has now taken place is that uh, the public relations has gone across the uh, boundaries of uh, what these people have been doing in the past. And uh, they are now they seem to be getting into territories where they are also making contributions toward not just developing the image of the organization, but also toward accomplishment of the mission of the organization. Now, this is the real crux of the matter. Public advocacy uh, basically involves itself in changing the structure of social norms and values. It uh, works not only at uh, the organization level, it also works at the macro level, which is the society level. Now, let me explain the whole concept in a little detail. Many non-profit managers and scholars are of the view that uh, there has been and still is a lot of undue uh, stress on uh, the behavior change of individuals uh, because uh, the individual behaviors could basically flow out of uh, the social norms at a higher social level. It all depends on the social conditions uh, which uh, give rise to individual behaviors. So in other words, if uh, there are a lot of people in the society uh, who take to smoking, it is because the society accepts smoking as something fashionable and as something which is sophisticated. There was a time when smoking was considered as fashionable and sophisticated because uh, there was no movie in which the main characters did not smoke. 
there was no social party there were people did not smoke and there were no public place where people did not smoke which is not the case now ever since the awareness on okay, the part of the general public following revelations okay, from the, the medical field that smoking really is injurious and it can kill people uh, some public advocates could have done a marvelous job of uh, uh, a campaign that went against smoking and particularly in the US uh, bringing about a primary change in the very concept of uh, the uh, or rather the structure of uh, the social norms and values of the society at that time. The society with which all ways kind of had thought uh, that smoking okay, was good and fashionable okay, was forced to believe otherwise. That smoking is not good, it is bad, and as a result, advertising it was banned, and uh, all the cigarette packets uh, contained uh, the warnings, uh, which they contain even today, and uh, advertising world is becoming more and more stringent in terms of deciding to what extent to publicize um, the area of smoking. So this basically is uh, the one uh, classic example of uh, how public advocacy can change the values at a higher level of the society. And this is what scholars call the upstream. The advocacy that uh, work at the upstream level of the society uh, is uh, good for the downstream individual values as well because it becomes um, less difficult uh, for um, public advocates to uh, bring about uh, the changes in individual behaviors because once they have changed the overall structure of the societal values and norms this is what the whole concept is all about and smoking campaign, rather anti-smoking campaign, it happens to be one of the uh, most classic examples of uh, the social advocacy in the literature of uh, non-profits. This component is about uh, public relations versus marketing. There is a dire need for us to understand in clarity what is the difference between public relations and marketing because we've been learning things which could fall on both sides of the fence. Whether it is uh, the PR which is more important or is it marketing that's uh, all encompassing. That is something that uh, we have to decide on. And uh, toward that, uh, we have to take a look at uh, the PR first. And uh, we know that uh, the public relations has been around for as long as organizations have been around. And therefore, uh, there are a uh, the few functions uh, which PR managers uh, have been carrying out very effectively all along uh, the years uh, that, that uh, I've talked about in historical perspective. And the things that they have been doing very effectively are, they always uh, they anticipated the problems uh, which uh, can befall uh, their organizations. And they always have been prepared to face those uh, negative situations. And uh, they always uh, have created opportunities uh, whereby they could uh, plant some positive and interesting stories uh, with the media. Um, with the press in particular, uh, so that uh, they can uh, maintain the positive image uh, of their uh, organizations. And uh, the public relations people always uh, have been following public-oriented policies uh, which uh, were good for the organization and uh, which also uh, were good for the cause you know, they were working for. And also, they have been putting together communication campaigns for the organizations they worked for. Uh, these campaigns have been in oral form as well as in written form. And uh, I will not go to the extent of saying that uh, these communications could have been as comprehensive and as strategic as uh, the marketing people have starting putting together because the public relations never had the kind of perspective which uh, the marketing people have. Now, this is not to bias you to begin with, but uh, this is a statement, I think, which I have to make uh, in the very beginning of the discussion. Public relations managers could always have been working as uh, the part of uh, top management uh, of their organizations. And the fact is uh, they always have been involved in the top-notch things and they were always in the picture of uh, what was going on within the organization and what the organizations were up to in terms of uh, affecting their uh, audiences until uh, the marketing really came up. So the question here is, 
how do we draw the comparison between these uh, public relations managers and marketing managers? Well, the answer lies in the fact that uh, there are uh, so many audiences that are uh, common to both the areas, to the area of uh, PR as well as to the marketing. This is not the case with commercial and the marketing sector. I think I have to draw your attention in order to clarify the, your perspective uh, in terms of the comparison between these two areas uh, the, in the nonprofits. The commercial sector um, operates uh, very clearly uh, in terms of uh, the marketing and sales of their products. Well, even uh, when they are uh, operating in, in the services, uh, the marketing, they're very clear about uh, the selling their services. Uh, they start uh, developing a certain product and then they go all the way down to distributing that product and uh, uh, the putting together all the four piece of uh, the marketing mix uh, the in total clarity and uh, the in uh, not isolation but uh, the in uh, almost independence of the, the PR area. And the PR area would take care of uh, the image perception. I don't think a lot of examples are to be given here to clarify this perspective, but I think I would like to draw your attention uh, toward the uh, recall on part of uh, car manufacturers and uh, the motorbike manufacturers uh, who um, like to remove the defect uh, which they think uh, has gone unnoticed into the marketplace. And uh, PR people coming into a great action uh, by planting positive stories about their organizations and the steps they have taken to rectify the defect. They also talk in terms of what really caused the defect and then try to cover up uh, the, um, the shortcoming uh, with the help of uh, some of uh, the positive uh, the happenings that surround their uh, situation at that particular time. And because of the fact that, uh, that they have a good relationship with the media, the media also gives them the benefit of the doubt. So this is where the whole uh, crux of the matter is you have to develop good relationship with the media. Back to the area of nonprofits, where lines between PR and marketing are not drawn as distinctly as you have seen on the commercial side, uh, we have to make an effort to draw those lines. The reason the lines tend to be a little fuzzy because both the areas of the PR as well as marketing deal with some common audiences. And it is this uh, the basic overlap that uh, the causes uh, the some problems and some frictions and also some tensions. And therefore, the, our job is to make sure that uh, the two complement each other and not uh, be at odds with each other. And the fact of the matter is that uh, the PR people can do um, a lot of uh, the support work for the marketing people. Uh, it will be very clear um, when I talk about the concept of uh, the marketing mix, uh, how uh, the marketing uh, is all encompassing and uh, PR is just one of the subsets. But the fact remains that uh, the PR uh, could uh, be supportive of uh, the marketing effort and therefore the lines could have to be drawn in terms of uh, the PR uh, working mostly in uh, those uh, areas that are uh, supportive to the cause toward mission accomplishment, but which do not really infringe on the uh, formulation of marketing strategies and marketing tactics. This is all that we can say um, in order to bring about clarity between the two. And it will be a little more clear in a moment when I talk about uh, the uh, tension factor and um, uh, the uh, real difference uh, between the two. Let me say a few more words about uh, what really has caused uh, this uh, the particular tension in addition to the fuzzy lines that we see uh, the, between the two areas. Uh, one, one of the reasons is that uh, the PR has existed, has rather pre-existed uh, the marketing in uh, non-profit organizations. And uh, it has uh, been a recent phenomenon that uh, the experts thought that uh, the marketing savvy from the commercial sector could be borrowed and uh, applied uh, as effectively in the non-profit sector uh, when uh, the PR people started feeling threatened. And uh, the fact is uh, when uh, the marketing departments came up, uh, the PR people 
uh, started uh, feeling kind of uh, relegated to positions they were not really used to because they used to be all important a group and uh, finding uh, the marketing people with the doing those jobs uh, which are more prestigious which are better paid and uh, which are more sophisticated they found they were at a disadvantage and uh, they were a little uh, demotivated and this uh, basically has uh, caused the tension between pr people and the marketing people so i would again say that uh, it all uh, depends on the uh, smartness you know, for the marketing managers to take you know peer people along with them because there are certain constituencies and audiences which really are the specialization of peer people for example when it comes to dealing with the governmental or international agencies it is the pr managers who will do the job we have been learning all along the course so far that the marketing has to be in contact with all these audiences and we need to have communication campaigns that are tailored for the different audiences but it is now more clear that this job is done with the help of pr specialists because they are the ones who are used to um, collecting all the information regarding all those agencies that took the support the nonprofit causes and therefore they are the ones whose input in that particular regard is absolutely essential the marketing people are already too much engrossed with uh, the, all the four piece of uh, the marketing mix and therefore going out and dealing with uh, uh, an audience uh, which is um, not really familiar uh, with um, the, uh, the marketing uh, the efforts being carried out by marketing people and vice versa meaning the marketing people uh, not being very familiar with the way they work um, the two the will always find themselves at odds when they interact with each other so the interaction that has to come through those specialists who specialize in dealing with that particular audience so this is where the uh, importance of pr comes in and this is just the one example there could be uh, there so many other audiences where their importance really uh, overwhelms the uh, the marketing uh, expertise and uh, overwhelms in respect of providing support in terms of uh, providing a supplement to the overall aggregate marketing effort having known all that we now have a chance to look at the real difference between public relations and marketing having known um, the audiences with which uh, the pr people interact and specialize in uh, the handling them and managing them i think you know it now has become clear that uh, the pr still remains a communication tool the pr is not the something which can replace marketing the various marketing conversely is something all encompassing marketing basically takes into consideration all the four p's and marketing basically deals with the marketing mix and i think that's where lies the answer and you know could we are talking about the product place pricing and uh, promotions and all these the four p's are so comprehensive that we are talking about uh, a host of activities and strategies of which the pr just happens to be the one part and that is why i said that uh, the pr uh, supplements marketing and uh, it is a support a great support and therefore the pr has got to be the part of marketing and not otherwise another uh, the big difference is that uh, the public relations does not define goals for the organization whereas uh, the marketing is responsible for defining the goals uh, the marketing uh, defines uh, the target audiences uh, that gets into the segmentation uh, it uh, establishes the positioning and uh, based on positioning it uh, defines objectives goals and then gets into the complete formulation of uh, the strategies for the whole program so this is a big difference between the pr and marketing and i think with this we are now very clear about what pr is and the place of pr as the part of the overall marketing program